James Leslie Mitchell was a Scottish writer. He was born in 1901 in Orchelis, Aberdeenshire, the son of James Mitchell and Lily Gibbon. He attended Mackey Academy and in 1917 began to work for the Aberdeen Journal. In 1919, he joined the Royal Army Service Corps serving in Iran, India and Egypt. In 1920, he joined the Royal Air Force where he worked as a clerk. In 1925, he married Rebecca Middleton and settled in Welwyn Garden City. He died here of peritonitis in 1935. He often wrote as Lewis Grassic Gibbon and his most famous work was A Scott Square, a trilogy where the first volume, Sunset Song, was voted Scotland's favourite book as far as 2005. We shall cover his decidedly non-Scottish Persian Dawn's Egyptian Nights from 1932. The book consists of two segments. The first has the nameless narrator while visiting the Monastery of Merv discover thousands of ancient crumbling pages in the sometimes illegible crab writing of the Nestorian Bishop of the Lost Diocese of Alarlu, Nisa Nerses, who wrote his hodgepodge record of history, legend, theology and agriculture in the late 13th century. When the land was beset and ravaged by the Mongols, the lost constituent tells the story of Mirza Marik Berku, a slave boy turned general who wins many great victories for the Caliph, and in return he is banished from Baghdad because he is too popular. In his seclusion he is obsessed with finding the elixir of life, but just as he thinks he found the final constituent he is missing, the Mongols break through the city gates and cut his head off. The lovers concerns Nerses' son Hormiz being in the guard of the Caliph as the Mongols fire Baghdad, and how he narrowly avoids being massacred and having his head added to the giant pyramid of skulls the Khan demands raised outside the city. For the giant of a man, Gezir Noyan, one of the Khan's vassals from the far north, sees him about to be massacred and saves his life. Made a slave of on orders of the Khan for this insolence, Hormiz saves him in turn and brings him back to Alarlu. But in the end, both set off never to return, to go to Gezir's home in the far north, on Hormiz's insistence, despite Gezir's love for his sister Amima. In the floods of spring, Bishop Nerises is sought out by the elders of the village of Bushu, whose priest is dead, and whose people are turned from the work of repairing the ruined dams and planting by a mysterious pair of semi-giants, Zaya and Romi. The bishop forces the villagers to maddened work to stay ahead of the great seasonal flood, but as it comes too early, all seems lost, until Zaya and Romi, speaking cryptically of their great older dream, seem to melt the whole mountain before the waters come, and then shoot themselves as a pair of gleaming lights into the sky. The last ogre has Amima beg her father to let her hunt on a distant mountain, fear to be haunted by demons. Nerezes does not allow her to go, but go she does anyway, and spends the night in a cave of the last Neanderthal, mourning the death of his last surviving child, before he is shot to death in the morning by Nerises' chaplain Adon. Cartaphilus concerns by son Ewid, dishonored knight of the kingdom of Armenia, imprisoned in the dungeons of Sis for daring to steal one of King Hetum's favorites. In his cell, the tortured Ewid knows he is in the presence of Cartaphilus, the wandering Jew, and he then spends years following his trail, trying to convince him to embrace Jesus to bring about the second coming, but he wanders so long he is taken for the wanderer himself, and he never finds him, until he sees Cartaphilus again as Evid lays dying in the dungeons of the Caliph. Dawn in Alarlu is the final record of Bishop Nerises. As his strength is leaving him, Nerises wanders to what nunnery to send his daughter for the rest of her life after his death. Around the same time, the villagers capture Petros Ishai, a renegade monk who murdered his abbot for beating an old man viciously. Amima seems to fall in love with Petros, especially after she finds out what her father has planned for her, and so the two run away, and the bishop lets them, going to await his coming end in the monastery of Merv, his great chronicle left unfinished. The second segment, Egyptian Nights, takes place in Egypt in the early 20th century, and is not even remotely as good. The pathos is not there, and while the story of faking an adventure to appease a far too imaginative novelist's hunger for oriental adventure is a fun idea, and Dionekes' dream has a modern Greek exile fighting on a barricade to defend his home, who coincidentally may have been the Spartan Dionekes who fought at Thermopylae in a past life, but these moments are few and far between, and one wishes Mitchell wrote more entries for the Chronicles of Nerises instead.